Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. Remember this guy? Yes, it's the Spectra Video 328 that gave us oh so many headaches a few months ago. But today is the long promised episode in which we're going to learn what this machine is about and try to run some games on it. So how do we go about loading some games? This is primarily a cartridge machine, but the cartridge format is different than the MSX ones. So anything I have for MSX won't work in here. People have made SD cartridge expansions for the SVI 328, but I never got around to getting one of those. So plan B, let's load it the old fashioned way. Let's get a tape player and oh, there are two problems with that. The first problem is that I don't actually own any SVI 328 tapes. And if I did, chances are they may not be working at all after all this time. It's much easier to download the images from the internet, which are in some format like TSX or something like that. That means it's not a recording of the sound in the tape, but the actual data embedded in it, plus the information about rate, pauses, etc. We can't use that from a tape player, but we could use a smartphone or a computer to play back the right sounds. Unfortunately, that often has problems with the output volume. So I'm going to look into using a dedicated custom device to play back those files, the TZX Duino Reloaded. TZX Duino Reloaded is an open source project that uses an Arduino to load TZX and other format files from an SD card and generate the signals so they can be loaded correctly from a variety of devices. It even has an LCD to allow you to navigate the different files and give feedback as to what's being played. Really slick project with a very small footprint. Since the Gerber files are available online, let's go ahead and build one of those from scratch. Today's sponsor is very conveniently PCBWay, so let's use their services to try to build this TZX Duino Reloaded board. So now I'm going to go to PCBWay.com and I'm going to upload the Gerber files for the TZX Duino project. So I just click on there, select it from the disk and yep, there it is. That looks about right. It has a bunch of parameters. I'm not gonna change any of them except for the color. I like it better blue. Other than that, everything looks good. So let's buy it. Hmm, I wonder who that is. Oh, hi. Hi. There's a package for you. Thank you. That was fast. Okay, let's see what's inside. So, there we go. It looks like we got the PCBs we just ordered. They look great. What else did we get here? Oh, a pen and some stickers. <laughs> cool. All right, let's build one of those. Okay, and these are pretty much all the components that you need for this project. As you can see, it's pretty simple. It's mostly the Arduino, uh, what is it called, Nano, I think. There's an OLED screen, and then a couple SMD um, integrated circuits, like um, a voltage regulator and things like that, an audio jack, a switch, and um, some tactile switches for controlling that. I mean, and obviously there's the SD card reader. So there isn't that much to it. One thing that goes here is a USB connector. It's a micro um, US, I think it's called micro USB connector. And I went ahead and ordered some because I didn't have any of that type. As you probably know, there's a bunch of USB connector shapes and this is, I think, called a micro USB connector. And this is only used for five volts. There's no data going in or out. And lo and behold, when I get this and I try to put it in place, it doesn't fit. So what's going on? Well, I didn't know this until pretty recently, but one thing is the shape of the connectors. That's the micro USB. And then there's another one is the footprint on the board. And apparently there's tons of different variations of that one. So what I ended up doing is instead of trying to figure out, okay, which one is exactly this one, I just went ahead and ordered a kit or not a kit, but an assortment. These are all micro USBs and they're all different footprints. So one of these is going to have to work, right? Um, I just need to figure out which one of those corresponds to that footprint. So I did find one that fits perfectly. So good thing, one out of those 10 different models. 
this is exactly the one that this was intended for. So let's go with that one. When I was looking at the bill of materials, I thought, okay, I have this, I have this, I marked things that I knew I had. And one of the things in here is a, the over here, is a variable resistance and between you know, zero and 10K. I'm like, okay, yeah, no problem, I have that. As a matter of fact, I have a whole assortment of them and there's a bunch of 10K. Well, it turns out I didn't read it carefully enough and this is an SMD 10K variable resistance. So this is not going to work. This is only for the amplifier, which is optional. Instead of waiting, you know, ordering some and waiting weeks or months, what I'm just going to do maybe at first is just short it. And so there will be like the variable resistance at the minimum, it will be the maximum volume. And if that's not okay, we can do some experiments. We can run some wires into one of those until we find the right thing, or we can just randomly put a halfway point, like 5K um, resistance in there. So we can, uh, we can play with that. And then at some point when I get the real SMD variable resistance, I'll swap it out. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to try out that cheap LCD microscope that we saw a few episodes ago for the SMD soldering in this project. As usual, I start with a lot of flux, place the IC in place, and solder one of the corner pins. Then we can go ahead and do all the others. And I have to say, so far the microscope is great. There's definitely a little bit of lag, more than I realized, so it takes a little bit of getting used to. That and the fact that I'm not looking down, but I'm looking forward. There are a couple places on the board that we're not supposed to put the components listed and instead we're just supposed to short them out. There was some kind of error with the amplifier, so this is the recommended way of building it to get the proper bias on the amplifier. And small components like the capacitors is the same thing. Flux, some solder. Sometimes it seems a little hard for it to be properly aligned. But if you're using enough flux, it just goes by itself in place like it does right now. And we do the same thing with the rest of the components, resistances and everything. There really aren't that many SMD components. This particular IC, it's large enough that I'm going to do it without the microscope. The technique is exactly the same as before. And yeah, it's pretty easy at this size. Let's use the microscope to check all the soldering so far. And yeah, things look pretty good. The pins in the USB connector are particularly small. So I'm going to use, again, lots of flux, and I'm going to kind of drag the solder tip on top of them. It's not exactly a well tip, but it's good enough to do the job for those five pins. And compared to all those other components, the switch, it's massive and there's no problem at all soldering it. So there you go. That's all the SMD components. And there's those two links in there to choose the voltage. Apparently there are different kinds of LCD screens and the one I have is ground and VCC. So here, instead of calling them ground VCC, it's just out one and out two and connect out one to ground and out two to VCC. But um, this should be it. And all we have left are lots of pin headers and the buttons. So there are the rest of the components, all the buttons in the back, which are angled buttons to make it easier, the only electrolytic capacitor, and all the pin headers and the Arduino are all in place. We still need to do something about that variable resistance. So for now, I'm going to short it so as you know, to simulate maximum volume when we use the amplifier. All right, that should be good enough. So first thing, let's just see if it powers on and then we'll need to upload the correct program to the Arduino. Okay, that looks pretty good. Blinking light in there, power on the Arduino, power there, and that even the activity one also blinks in there. So 
I think this is looking pretty good. I've connected this USB to serial adapter and uh, putting ground in there and then the usual reversing transmit and receive. And we plug this directly into the computer. So now we need to load the firmware on the Arduino IDE. In this particular case, I'm using Max Duino. And the most important thing, it recognizes COM5, so that's good. And we need to switch it to Arduino Pro Mini, like that. And I guess we can do a verify first. And let's upload it to the device. This usually takes a little while, but the transmit and receive lights are blinking, so that's good. And there you go, you completed the upload. So I'm going to power it on just to see if we see anything different. Maybe we'll get, we'll get a message on the screen. Oh, there we go. There we go, no SD card. So that means the firmware is loaded correctly and now it's waiting for us to put some files on the SD card. Okay, let's try this. There we go, it did detect the SD card. Now we should be able to navigate it with the up and down buttons. So I have a Spectrum folder, ZX Spectrum, and a, an SVI328 that I just created. And here are some of the games that I picked to test. So even before we connect it to the SVI328, we should check that it's actually working. So I'm going to connect this to a speaker and then that way we'll be able to hear if it's generating the audio signal correctly. There we go. And I think this is with the amplifier off. If I turn it on, wow, yeah, much louder. So that's what we're missing with not having that adjustable resistance. We don't have a way to control the volume, but that's still good. That's great that we're hearing this. So let's try to test this on the SVI328 itself. Remember earlier that I mentioned there were two problems loading games from tape? Well, now we're getting to the second problem. The lack of DC jack for audio in. Um, you may think by looking at that, like, oh yeah, one of those has to be the, the cassette input, like a lot of computers have. But no, that's just the video and audio out. The actual cassette input is through this edge connector. So we need to do something to connect the audio out of our TZX Duino to this edge connector. So a while ago, I had this 3D adapter printed, and uh, 3D printed, obviously, I didn't design this. This is publicly available in Thingverse. And this fits perfectly on the 328 edge connector over there. So we really, if we just wanna play some audio, we just need to know which one is the ground and which one is the audio in signal. And we can just connect like a cable, an audio jack cable like this that has you know, already it's been mutilated for something else. And if we, if I can find some um, kind of metal connectors to put in there that actually fit this, that that's the main challenge right now. I'm not sure I have something that will make good contact. In the worst case, we can always solder those directly there as a temporary measure, but it would be really cool to put them here. So I'll see if I can cobble something together. So for this connector, I'm going to try to use this particular contact. This is part of a Molex strip, I believe. So let's see if we can manage to get that to work. So I really couldn't get the metal connectors to stay in place in here. I don't know if the kind of connectors I have are not the exact ones this 3D enclosure was designed for, or maybe it just doesn't have the resolution. Maybe it just needs a little tiny notch to sort of click them in place. But so what I did as a test, I put them in place and then I added some super glue underneath and they seem to be holding in place. The super glue is definitely not um, touching the metal part on top. Yeah, not the best job ever, but you know, if, if it works, then that's great. And as I said, if not, we'll just solder it directly. I love this idea. So I'd love to make this work, but for now, we can, we always have a fallback plan. It even came with a nice enclosure, so let's screw that on. 
Okay, let's give this a test. Since I'm not even sure the connector is working correctly, let's do some simple continuity tests. So we should get ground from here, from this part of the DC jack to, oh, perfect, that one is working. And both of those are connected to the read signal, which we should be this one. Oh, there we go. Okay. So at least we know those two are working perfectly fine, even with that weird way that we connected, we put those connectors in there. Before we test it, there's one more thing we need to do. The cassette interface of the SVI328 has a few more signals. We don't really care about writing back to tape for now, but there are two other ones that we should look into. One of them is the ready signal coming back from the tape player. I'm guessing this is active when the motor is on. The TCX Duino doesn't have support for this as far as I know. Even though it's not listed with a bar in top or a slash in front, I see that it's an active low signal since it has a pull-up resistor. So we can just tie it to ground and as far as the SVI328 is concerned, the tape player will always be ready. The other signal is the CAS ON, which lets the computer control when the tape is playing and when it stops. It's not strictly necessary, but it's nice to have, and the TCX Duino does support it, so we might as well hook it up. For that, we'll use this second audio jack, which at first I thought it was redundant. It's a, this is a 3.5, and I thought I'd give you the option of 2.5. No, this 2.5 one is for the remote control. So that one goes there, and we'll use a cable with the um, that will just carry the remote signal information. And now, finally, time to try it. We plug in the audio jack, the remote jack, and let's not forget the USB for power. So I'm going to select Spectron, which is some kind of Space Invaders clone, and let's play it and notice how it pauses. It's waiting for the computer to send the cassette on signal. On the computer, we type C load, which activates the tape player, and the Arduino correctly starts playing the file. Unfortunately, we don't have any audio feedback. The MSX computer doesn't let you hear what's being loaded, and the TCX Duino doesn't have support for playing back that sound, but we see that it's being played because the percentage goes up. Unfortunately, the SVI328 is not detecting anything, and it just sits at the C load screen. All right, let's try to figure out what's going on. I'm going to be looking at the signal created by the TCX Duino with the oscilloscope. So we're just gonna hook up to one of these pins for ground. And at the same time, I'm going to plug it into the speaker just so we can hear uh, what's going on with the signal. Incidentally, I was looking into this and even though the writing on the board almost implies that to the right, the switch is the bypass of the amplifier, it's actually to the left. And I also read that MSX computers work fine without amplification. So we don't have to worry about all the complicated um, not necessarily complicated, but all the part of the circuit that deals with amplification. And in that case, the output on pin 9 should be sent directly as the sound into the, um, the audio jack. Okay, I'm going to probe pin 9. Okay, we hear it, but that's a really bad signal. It, there's not much of an amplitude, and it's biased around... 2.2 2 volts or something? That's not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, let's just to make sure that there's no amplification going on. I believe I can get it there. Yeah, this is the exact same signal. I'm surprised it sounds so good. I, this has to be some kind of amplification going on in there. Okay. So now let's try it with the amplifier on. And that looks absolutely horrible there. So supposedly we're amplifying it, but we hear something. But is, so that doesn't seem to work at all. And the input, oh, wow. So the input signal, that's the way it's supposed to be. From zero, here, I'll do it again. From zero to five volts, that's the perfect signal that we should be generating. So turning off the amplifier changes the signal generated by the Arduino. So there has to be some kind of weird short or something. So I started reverse engineering a little bit the circuit from what I could 
gather from the connections and knowing that this is an amplifier and this is some kind of um, just buffer. And then I realized one assumption that I made that was incorrect and is probably what's causing the problem. Pin one on the amplifier, um, it's the signal for the gain. And that is coming from the variable resistor here. And specifically, that's coming from the point that I left without soldering. I, I looked at the data sheet, but I must have looked at it wrong. So I connected the wrong points. If I want to give the amplifier maximum gain, I really should connect the top point to the high voltage. So let's go ahead and do that right now and see if that changes things. This seems to have really improved things. So if I have the switch right in the middle and we play something, we get the perfect signal. But if we turn it to no amplifier, we actually get the signal, but with all that extra noise in there, that's almost, it's not really a noise, it's almost like a clock signal built in. So that's really bizarre. But the interesting bit is that if I turn it on to amplifier, like before, the signal there is fine, but now the signal there is also totally fine. It's actually not very big. So that could have to do with the variable resistor, but that looks totally clean. So I suspect this could be used and I don't know what's going on, why when we bypass the amplifier, we get that weird clock signal mixed in. I'm definitely not liking this design for many reasons. And one of them is you know, obviously all the patches you have to do to the board. The, the fact that the amplifier seems to interfere even in bypass mode and that you know, apparently it's not very needed for a lot of computers. Maybe it's more needed for the ZX Spectrum now that I think about it. All right, let's see if that makes a difference. Let's start without the amplifier. So this is the one that has noise. And try to load something. And yeah, it doesn't do anything. It just hangs in there. Okay, so now let's turn the amplifier on, which we saw had a better signal, and try to load it again. And look at that, it picks it up right away. Wow, first time we see anything being loaded here. All right, let's see if it loads the whole thing. That garbage you're seeing on the screen, by the way, that's normal. That's the program data being loaded on the screen directly. Apparently the SVI-328 has a mode in which we can load data directly into screen memory. And so that's what we're seeing. You're actually seeing a visual representation of whatever data the program is using. I don't know if this was done like that originally or not. I know that's a trick that I used a lot when I used to bypass copy protections on the Amstrad. So maybe it's a similar way and somebody created a cracked copy of this game and the original game didn't do that. I'm, I'm not sure. And there you go. It loaded the whole Spectron game. Wow. First time we load anything. That certainly took a lot of work. All right, so I did some more research and I think I figured out what the problem with this is. And if that's the case, it's a design flaw on the board itself, which uh, in itself, it's an interesting problem and also highlights why it's so important that any boards that you build that you really care about, they really should have a some kind of circuit schematics. It's very frustrating that this one didn't. I had to reverse engineer everything by just checking connections. So let's go through this. If I have this in the middle position, and I'm not even playing anything right now, the audio out on the Arduino is just what you would expect, is zero volts, no variation there. But as soon as I put this to the left, so meaning bypass amplifier, look what happens. And this is, I'm actually really zoomed in. Um, this is what we're seeing before. And if you zoom way in, you see a 150 kilohertz signal. This is with it off. And if we start playing something, this 150 kilohertz signal will be on top of whatever we we're playing. That's why the computer couldn't load anything with the amplifier off. If I turn the amplifier on, then obviously th this goes away and there, there is nothing there because we're not playing a signal. So what's going on? The amplifier, even though we're in bypass mode, is fully powered. So it is getting five volts. And same thing with this one. This one is pin one. 
So in bypass mode, I would expect them to get nothing, to not be powered at all. And that's why we have five volts in this second set of pins. But there's a mistake in here. So it seems like in this mode to the left, the sound output is sent here directly, but the amplifier and the uh, filter or the buffer is powered. Why do we care that it's powered? Because if you look at the input of the amplifier, we don't really see anything because we're not routing our, actually, we don't even have a sound signal right now, but we're not routing, routing our sound output in there. But since the amplifier is powered, it's actually amplifying that signal. And it's getting a very slight 150 kilohertz noise. It could be coming from the USB powered, probably. Um, maybe it's even picking up something else. And it's enough to be amplifying that and um, sending that to the, to the output. The problem is that the problem is that this switch is half backwards. Honestly, I think the best thing for now, since we don't need the amplifier, is to remove the switch completely and just hardwire the connection from the Arduino to the, um, the, the jack output and ignore all the 5 volt stuff. By the way, one word of warning about one of the options in Max Duino, because this is part of the firmware, there's this weird option apart from baud rate and motor remote signal called something like TSX Z blah, 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 like something that makes no sense if you don't know what the code does. Apparently that allows for higher loading speeds and maybe that's tied together to the baud rate that you set in the other option. I tried turning that on with the SVI328 and nothing loads whatsoever, even at 1200 baud. So it seems that for this particular computer, it's important to leave that off completely. And then I believe that the speed settings make absolutely no difference. So you won't be able to load it any faster with this particular firmware. So let's go ahead and try to load it again and make sure that everything still works. Yeah, it looks like it's loading. Awesome. It loaded no problem. So now we finally have a reliable way to load games on the SVI-328. Finally! One last update while we watch the game. I talked briefly to Edu Arana, the owner of the TCX Reloaded project, and I mentioned the problems that I had. And it looks like he's open to releasing an updated version of the board, probably 1.5, with the fixes that we talked about, and at the same time, fixing some of the other patches that we had to do, you know, like short some of the components and things like that. So we may have a newer version of this coming soon. He also mentioned that he may be willing to put the circuit diagram on GitHub as well, which would be huge for any kind of debugging like I had to do here. In spite of all the problems that we had, I would still recommend this board if you're interested in loading games this way. Just skip the amplifier part completely and even don't even bother with the switch, just hardwire the way I did until we get version 1.5 and then hopefully all of this will be fixed. Well, I have to admit that today's video didn't turn out the way I expected. I thought we were going to very quickly build the TCX Duino and move on to loading games and seeing what the SVI-328 is capable of doing. I honestly thought about cutting out all the parts of all the troubles that I was having with the TCX Duino and just make it like, okay, I built it, Sure, I cut out a few hours of debugging or whatever, and then move on to what I had planned. But then I thought it's actually interesting, I think, I hope, for people to see that when you build a project, even if it's a project you didn't design yourself, that sometimes you have problems. Sometimes the problems are caused by something you do, like maybe you connect something incorrectly and that happens. But sometimes the problem is with the design itself. And it's also important to identify that the same way that we look at faults in computers that are not working, sometimes you have to do the same thing on projects that you're building and designs that you didn't create yourself. So anyway, we're gonna have to save the promised look at the games on the SVI-328 for yet another episode, but now at least we know we are able to load games correctly. So I hope you enjoyed this odd episode. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube.
Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos and more. Thank you again to all the supporters, see you next time.